Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry for that. We are really apologize for the delay for five minutes. Uh, we will start the uh, uh, program. Kishan sir, is it my voice audible? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. I request you all for please put your video mode on for the actual discussion. Thank you. Before of CIPLA, I would like to welcome you all for the Strengthening Heart Expert Summit on MRI in HF. Today we have moderator as Dr. Hisham Ahamal, Interventional Cardiologist in AIMS Coaching. With the panelist number of Dr. Paul P. Noble from Physician and D. Maria Hospital Coaching and Dr. Vivek Stephen, Consulting Physician, General Hospital, Alwa, and Dr. Aji Balakrishnan, this is consulting physician, Charis Hospital, Muatipura, and Dr. Sunit, consulting physician, Alakar Hospital, Kodubura. Then Dr. Vincent A. B., physician, General Hospital, Kodamangala, and Dr. Abraham T. George, physician, Lutz Hospital, Cochin, and Dr. Rohit Jacob, physician, Krak Hospital, Kodungalu, and Dr. Satakatula, physician, K. Kim's Hospital, Kote. All are welcome. Over to you, Hisham, sir, for the content brief and the program. Sir. Yeah, I'll just share my uh, that, that slide if it's okay. One second. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's better. The slides are visible, yeah. Yeah, so, so good evening, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank, thank you for the uh, introduction. And uh, <clears throat> I, I thank uh, uh, the organization to, for this uh, online uh, platform so that uh, you know we can have a, a panel discussion on a important topic which is quite commonly faced by, uh, by all of us in our clinic. And um, essentially, we will be having a focused panel discussion on the use of uh, mineral corticoid receptor uh, antagonists. So uh, we know that it is one of the components of the foundational therapy of heart failure, the foundational therapy of heart failure as it stands today. Uh, of course, as you are all are aware, is uh, the our beta blockers, ACE or ARBs or ARMIs, uh, MRAs and SGLT2 inhibitors. So, so this is a, quite an exciting time for us, um, for all of us who treat uh, heart failure patients. Um, and of course, I'm joined in today's panel by um, by eight very experienced uh, physicians um, who will have a lot to share from their experiences in managing patients with heart failure, and especially focusing on um, uh, particularly the issue of utilizing uh, MRAs uh, in the treatment uh, of uh, heart failure. So uh, the format that we have chosen is um, we will have a series of uh, eight uh, questions which will address uh, most of the uh, clinical issues or clinical questions which are surrounding the use of MRAs in heart failure, and uh, and then um, and and then based on that interaction, um, you know we can all jump in for clarifications and um, and additional uh, points uh, from our practice um, if it sort of uh, illuminates um, the, the question being discussed. So so without um, you know without further ado. Uh, I'll just uh, like to move on to the uh, very first question, um, you know, that uh, uh, just to set the background of today's discussion. So, so essentially, um, I'd like to involve uh, Dr. Paul P. Noble um, um, to, to, to join us and discuss regarding what are the percentage of heart failure patients um, that, um, 
that we that you usually see uh, in NYHA stages two, three, and four. What percentages that that will form a part of your practice and and um, and what is your opinion regarding the the diagnosis, the stage of diagnosis of heart failure patients uh, in in our, in our healthcare setup? Uh, I mean, uh, do we do we detect them quite early, or do you think we often detect them um, after they've uh, advanced to stages uh, three and four? Uh, Doctor Paul, please. Is Dr. Paul there? Is Dr. Paul available uh, on the meeting? Yeah, uh, sir, the doctor is there. I think any technical error or something case shown like in that is. Okay. Um, maybe uh, can anyone contact him and to find out? Yeah, I, I will connect him. So, so can you please move to the next question? Yeah, sure. So, so we'll just wait on that. And, uh, so um, so we'll, we'll just uh, go to the next question. Is Dr. Vivek Stephen available on the meeting? Yeah, is Dr. Vivek available on the meeting? Hello? Yes, um, is Dr. Vivek there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, can hi. You hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Dr. Vivek, uh, cl clearly. Okay. Good evening. Yeah, Dr. Okay, Vivek, okay. I think uh, we were starting yeah. with the first question. Dr. Paul was not available. So so I'll just come right. to the next question. Uh, Dr. Vivek, the question uh, discuss uh, with you is that um, what do you what is your opinion regarding the, uh, the type of diagnostic and prognostic tools that uh, we must use for heart failure patients um, in your experience? And uh, um, could you discuss uh, that? Before? Thank you. Yes, yes. As usual, we usually rely on the detailed history as well as the symptoms like orthopnea, uh, dyspnea, uh, dyspnea on exertion, and dyspnea trust, then paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And in addition to that, we usually, uh, we, we are, if we are suspecting a case of heart failure, we will directly go for the um, ECG. Then if we, there will be signs of uh, sinus static or any uh, structural or functional uh, structural abnormality like left atrial dilatation or left ventricular hypertrophy, something like that. From the ECG itself, we can uh, uh, we can assess about the uh, right ventricle, about the left ventricle, and if we are sure about that, we will go for the routine blood examination. And there's a typical finding of hypo hyponatremia is common in cases of heart failure, as well as hypokalemia. The same case with the hypophosphatemia and also hypomagnesemia. Then, uh, from the ECG, if we are suspecting the suspecting that this patient has got heart failure, then we will go for a chest X-ray, which can show that the, the there might be if it is a decompensated heart failure, there will be bad swing appearance, typical prominent engulfed pulmonary arteries. Then uh, we may get peri uh, findings like peribronchial coughing. later condition, as well as there, there could be interstitial fluid collection, uh, uh, it's like curly lines. Then, of course, in 90 percentage of cases, there might be there might be right side of plural efficiency. Um, if you are uh, if you are still uh, if we ha we are having the same doubt, then we will go for the X-ray. Uh, I mean, echocardiogram. 
expectations of heart failure depending on the left ventricular ejection fraction it is, if it is less than 40 percentage as it's a left ventricular ejection fraction with less less than 40 percentage we classify it as heart failure with a reduced ejection so in that case in the so if it is a reduced ejection fraction of less than 40 percentage then we are pretty sure that this is a heart failure with the symptoms and plus or minus heart failure plus in our two cases heart failure and also moderate uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction uh, that is less uh, between 40 to 49 percentage or more than 49 percentage uh, actually we, uh, we have in addition to the symptoms of symptoms and signs of heart failure we go for this bnp brain natriuretic uh, natriuretic peptide as well as the, the there should be minimum one of the following echo findings like left ventricular hypertrophy and the left atrial enlargement or there should be an evidence of diastolic dysfunction so these are the criteria we usually we usually uh, do to assess a patient of patient in heart failure yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Doctor Vivek. Um, I, I think okay. I, 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 thank you. I, 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 I largely agree um, with. I mean, you have clearly, you know, outlined the various segments in which the heart failure patient should be evaluated. Um, so I just, I just summarize what Doctor Vivek said: is that essentially you have to look for the symptom complex of heart failure. Uh, the second step yes. is to understand whether it's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, it's to make out this difference. Okay. Okay. Clinical factors can differ, you know, in either of these two entities. Um, yeah. And uh, you can have a look at whether the patient has a reduced LV ejection fraction or a reduced RV function. And of course, you have okay, right. ejection fraction. And of course, okay. uh, when, when patients come with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction to prognosticate them, as you mentioned, uh, NT pro BNP for diagnosis as well as for prognosis is very useful. And very useful. Uh, you know, when a patient comes with a very depressed EF, of let's say less than 35%, an important part of prognostication is also to do a 24 to 72 hour ambulatory monitoring. Uh, uh, especially to look for any particular, you know, ventricular arrhythmias, which, look for. which can be, uh, which can potentially complicate uh, the situation. So that is one more step of the uh, risk stratification. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Oh. So, so with that, um, um, so now that we have understood yeah. that, the diagnostic and prognostic tools that are available to us uh, for essentially managing heart failure patients. We'll move on to the, um, uh, question number three, which is, which is essentially, um, so uh, is uh, Dr. Abraham uh, yes. on the meeting? Uh, is he available? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Dr. Abraham. So, so, so essentially, since at the outset I mentioned that we'll be focusing on the clinical utility utilization of MRAs in heart failure. And of course, uh, uh, monitoring potassium is something important, um, you know, when uh, drugs are initiated. So uh, we'd just like to know your opinion on um, what are the parameters um, that are usually tested before initiating MRAs, and when will you consider monitoring potassium uh, after initiating the patient on MRAs? Yeah, we start on, uh, I mean, uh, before the treatment and after the treatment, we start on... Uh, the usual uh, potassium levels, uh, the creatine levels, sodium levels, and the EGFR. That's uh, uh, these are the tests done before we start with the uh, MRI. I mean, we start with the mineral corticoid uh, uh, this thing, MRS, and uh, start after starting the treatment. We wait for uh, two weeks and then retest it. Same thing. That's the one. Whether the potassium level has come down or a creatine has uh, gone up or uh, how is the EGFR and all. We wait for two two weeks and then we retest it after that. Uh, uh, Dr. Abraham, uh, are there any circumstances where would you would like to uh, uh, test it earlier? Uh, are there any clinical circumstances in which... I mean, the, if the condition worsens, yeah. Or the heart failure persists, yes. Yes, or the patient becomes sick and do it early. Yes. 
Yes, I, I, I think uh, Dr. Ibrahim has, has been, you know, uh, right spot on uh, in, 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 you know, it, and, and I think what he has quoted is exactly what the guidelines have suggested. So, um, yeah, so you know, just to re-emphasize, re the, the recent ACC HA heart failure guidelines uh, concerning MRA use um, has more or less implemented the very same protocol which Dr. Abraham has shared with us. And um, I'd just like to reproduce those guidelines for you. So essentially, um, after MRA initiation, the recommendation is to initially test for the potassium at least one or two later. And then after another four weeks, and then after that, it's every six months thereafter. So there are yeah. a few, as Dr. Abraham has shared, I think he has made it very clear that, you know, if the patient's GFR is considered to be deteriorating in the interim period, or if the patient's heart failure is worsening, um, those are definitely situations where you would want to monitor this patient even before. Uh, the uh, the intervals that we have just uh, mentioned. So, well, I think what uh, Dr. Abraham has shared is very consistent with uh, the published uh, ACC AHA guidelines. So uh, now that we know what all parameters that we would check uh, before uh, MRA use, and we we have a general idea of how to monitor them uh, after we have initiated. Um, probably we'll just come to a much more clinical question now. Um, I'd like to involve Dr. Ajay Balakrishnan at this point in time. And um, I'd just like to know uh, uh, a doctor's experience in terms of um, in what percentage of patients in your practice of heart failure um, uh, have you considered using uh, MRAs? Dr. Ajay Balakrishnan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for welcoming me to uh, uh, we have some problem with the audio a little bit. I think you can hear me. Uh, now I can hear you clearly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, more than fifty percent of my patient of congestive cardiac failure in this, uh, we try to use this drug because the most uh, important thing is by adding uh, AC inhibitor, beta blockers, statins, and the platelets. I use spironolactone in my clinical practice in congestive cardiac failure patients, especially when there is congestive cardiac failure with LV dysfunction. We try to always introduce the spironolactone so that it will reduce the mortality rate in the patient with congestive cardiac failure. So the drugs which decrease the mortality rate in the congestive cardiac failure are one is spironolactone, especially with uh, congestive cardiac failure with coronary artery disease, beta blocker, ARB or a AC inhibitor, antiplatelet drugs, and statins. These five drugs are the main five drugs which reduce the mortality rate, like mortality rate and benefit the patient with congestive cardiac failure. As all drugs are symptomatic, which can reduce the clinical symptoms of the patient, but mortality reduction is with these five drugs. In these five drugs, it includes the final actor, our mineral or particular receptor antagonist, and we try to add this drug to each and every patient with congestive cardiac failure unless they uh, uh, tolerate the drug or the patient can afford the drug. We use it very often. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Ajay Barishan. I think uh, that's a, that's a, you know a very a very succinctly put review of the position and role of MRAs in heart failure management. And I think, as uh, Dr. Aji has said, uh, there is no question that uh, MRAs you know should form the foundational therapy. That is the four foundational therapies. It definitely has a solid place amongst them. And clearly, you know, clearly, uh, you know, uh, said that the basic really should. The use of MRAs clearly is associated with significant reductions in cardiovascular mortality, all-cause mortality, and heart failure hospitalization. So, so I think the main clinical lesson that we can take away from here 
is that as much as possible, MRAs must be a component of the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as much as possible. So I think uh, I think that that point was very well and elegantly laid out uh, by Dr. Ajit. So, so now that we've understood that uh, the role of MRAs are very important and it should form the foundational therapy of heart failure management, um, we will move on to the uh, next question. And often this is a clinical question which has which has which we have faced uh, very often um, uh, when we are faced with patients with uh, heart failure. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Vincent uh, uh, to the to the discussion now, and I'd like to pose the following question to Dr. Vincent: uh, so When would you consider starting MRAs uh, in a patient with heart failure, uh, along with either ARB and beta blockers? So, so what is your opinion or, or what is your opinion? Uh, I'm audible. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, very clearly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. In a patient with heart failure, uh, I will uh, consider starting MRI along with uh, AC inhibitors or ARBs and beta blockers, especially if the patient is having a uh, preserved ejection fraction, heart failure with the preserved ejection. And uh, many studies have come that uh, the MRIs, beta blockers, and uh, AC or ARB inhibitors patient uh, meeting criteria for the MRIs between study uh, shows that uh, if it is uh, with the uh, patients with the uh, heart failure with the uh, reduced ejection fraction, and uh, it is not that effective as those uh, the patients with heart failure with the uh, uh, preserved ejection fraction. Uh, many studies are uh, in, in regarding this. Uh, of course, uh, MRIs uh, play a very important uh, foundation regarding heart uh, failure with uh, uh, preserved ejection fraction and uh, reduced ejection fraction. With, Um, uh, uh, thank you, doc. thank you, Dr. Vincent. Um, so, so I think, so I think, just to reiterate, I think, um, I think Dr. Vincent has made it clear um, that uh, starting uh, MRAs in a patient with heart failure, and especially heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, along with the other foundational therapies, um, are very important. And, and particularly in relation to this question, you can see three, uh, two other foundational therapies on this slide. That is ACE or ARB, and beta blocker, and of course. Uh, the other uh, foundational therapies are ARNI instead of ACE or ARB, and of course, uh, the SGLT2 uh, inhibitor. So just a comment uh, from my side regarding the timing of starting MRAs in patients with heart failure along with the other agents. So, so in 2020, um, so two major heart failure groups made the suggestion that, uh, that we follow a rapid sequencing over four weeks to the initiation of these foundational therapies. So what they suggested in step one is to start beta blockers and SGLT2 inhibitors in their starting doses. Then two weeks later to add on ACE, ARB or ARMI. And then another two weeks later or two or three weeks later to start on MRAs. So these, these intervals are not uh, set in stone. They are left to the clinician's discretion. But in this rapid sequencing methodology, the aim is to start most of the four foundational therapies over a four to six week period. So, and of course, um, as mentioned before, uh, we will keep monitoring the patients for worsening GFR, for hyperkalemia, and therefore adjust these time frames as necessary. So the rapid sequencing methodology is the current standard, um, which uh, we must aim to follow in patients, in patients with um, heart failure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilson. So we'll move on to the uh, next question. So I'd like to, um, uh, Dr. Sadakutullah. Is Dr. Sadakutullah on the meeting? No, sir. That question, we will take it up on end. Sir. All right. Sure. Yeah, sure. So we'll just move on to the uh, question number seven. So again, uh, this is you know often clinically encountered uh, uh, issue. So once we decided to start a patient on uh, MRA, so either it's epilirinone or spironolactone, uh, what would be the preferred dose and what is the dose titration um, in your practice? So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Rohit Jacob uh, to take this question. So the question is, what would be the preferred initial dose of either spironolactone or um, epilirinone 
And how would you like to titrate this as you move forward? Dr. Rohit, please. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, question. It's an honor to be here. Me being just a beginner in the clinical practice, about one or two years of experience with such eminent faculties, it's really an honor. So uh, considering my personal experience up till now, which is very short, which I feel is that uh, I start spironolactone at a dose of nearly 25 milligram per day or epiluronone also I start with the similarly uh, the same dose. But if the patient is an elderly female with, uh, let's say, after uh, completing one week course of epiluronone or spironolactone, I find that creatinine is rising or potassium is getting higher and so, so on and forth. Uh, many controversial studies, they say that either you need to reduce the dose or you can stop it, both showing contrasting results regarding the mortality and morbidity results. But I would directly stop it, although studies say that reducing dose is much better since benefit versus risk ratio is what we see. But to my personal experience, what I do is I start with spironolactone or epiluronone at 25 milligram per day. One week later, I monitor the EGFR, creatinine and potassium level. And if it remains stable or if it's not on the rising trend, then I repeat those monitoring parameters four weeks later, then eight weeks later, and then stabilize it over a pattern of six months. If the patient is showing rise in creatinine or rise in EG, uh, uh, sorry, uh, reduction in EGFR or rise in potassium levels, then I would reduce the dose of epiluronone to 12.5 milligram per day and then carry it forward. But again, close monitoring is essential because if there is worsening life-threatening symptoms of hyperkalemia, that can be more dangerous. So in such a scenario, I would uh, prefer to stop the drug rather than uh, you know causing more side effects to the patient. Yes, yes, uh, Dr. Rohit, I think, uh, thank you. I think, uh, I think this is a precise, uh, I think what you've shared is the precise recommendation, I think, which has been consistent regarding uh, initiation, titration, and monitoring of uh, MRAs. Um, so you're absolutely right when you say that you would like to start on uh, 25 milligrams once a day for either epiluronone or spironolactone, exactly what the recent ACCAHA guidelines recommend. And of course, then it becomes a balancing game balance between the of the drug and the balance between the potential adverse events which are noted during the monitoring period. As you rightly mentioned, the, the parameters which should be looked at are the EGFR and development of hyperkalemia. So generally, the guidelines say that you allow for a full four weeks uh, for, the, for the initial dose to reach equilibrium and to see whether the EGFR declines or whether the uh, potassium levels rise, and after a four-week interval, everything looks okay. Then possibly it is time to slow the upside rate to the targeted doses uh, according to the guidelines. So essentially, uh, I think Dr. Rohit has uh, clearly mentioned the stepwise methodology on how to do it. And of course, we must also, um, you know, remember that you know we are going to face patients who are at higher risk. Of, um, of developing hyperkalemia or a reduction in EGFR. And, and it's important clinically to sort of identify them quite early. So as Dr. Rohit mentioned, it could be an elderly lady with a redu reduced EGFR, borderline GFR of maybe 30 to 40. It could be borderline baseline uh, potassium from 4.5 to 5. So there are certain red flags baseline that we must uh, pay attention to. And those patients perhaps will need much more frequent monitoring. Uh, for our penetration. Thank you, Dr. Rohit, um, for 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 uh, for for that uh, for elucidating the initiation and monitoring of um, MRA in clinical practice. So we'll move on to the next question, um, and uh, this is so so of the two major adverse events of using MRAs. One is, of course, as Dr. Rohit said, uh, a reduction in EGFR must be looked at. The other, of course, that we know is what we all fear is your know, severe hyperkalemia. So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sunit uh, uh, to take on uh, this aspect of the discussion. And um, I would like to ask her in terms of what percentage of heart failure patients on MRAs uh, tend to develop hyperkalemia. And once they do, um, do you think that they always require discontinuation of treatment? Dr. Sunit, please. Thank you for the question. My question has got two parts. Actually, one person with heart failure develops hyperkalemia. Yeah. So for hyperkalemia is different in this. Yeah. In glitter. 
uh, and uh, anything any capacity more than five milligrams per liter for indication for sir related for indication starting the uh, MRAs. So there is not clear cut guidelines from like uh, studies from India, but uh, based on the global uh, studies, it is almost eighty to twenty percentage of the patients who are on mineral liver disorder antagonist with heart failure develop. Uh, at least one episode of hyperkalemia in the next one year. Most of them happening within the first three months of initiation. And hyperkalemia between mild hyper, mild to moderate hyperkalemia, that is between 5 to 5.5, usually occurs in 10 to 12 percent of the individuals, and more than uh, 5.5 happens in uh, people like uh, almost in almost to 8 percentage of the patients with heart failure. But one of the drawbacks about all these studies are that so many confronting factors about the rise in potassium. Uh, most of them will be on, as uh, Jisar had mentioned, most of them will be on AC inhibitors, AR base. Uh, some of them will be on SCL2 inhibitors. Uh, most of them will be having coexistent illnesses like chronic kidney disease. Some of them will be having a type 2 diabetes mellitus with a proteinuria. And some will be having an elderly age. So there is no separate uh, study that says that patients with the, all these confounding factors, how many of them will develop hyperkalemia? But usually, uh, considering all these confounding factors, 18 to 20 percentage of them will develop hyperkalemia. That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is do they require discontinuation of treatment? Okay, there are two studies there is RAIL study and MFA study where they have. Assess the risk and benefits, whether we have to go ahead with the hyperkalemia and the uh, treatment. Uh, according to those studies, they say that the mortality with the heart failure is much worse than the mortality due to the hyperkalemia. So, uh, according to the AHA guidelines now, it's like till five point, uh, from five, 5 to 5.5 5 milliequivalents of uh, potassium. With the close monitoring, we may continue the heart failure treatment with the MRI. And once it crosses more than 5.5, definitely we have to withhold it for a shorter period of time. Again, restrict the potassium. Again, uh, once the potassium is normalized, we try to reintroduce it. If it is not working, we have to withdraw the nanocorticoid uh, receptor and uh, uh, aldactone uh, uh, antagonist. Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Sunita. I think. Um, uh, that's it, it's a very very comprehensively you know uh, uh, you know done um, you know answer to the question which has been posed in the panel. So I think um, you're absolutely right. Uh, so initially uh, initially when the trials came, uh, the, um, the the rails emphasis and uh, Ephesus. Um, if you look closely at the trial data, the trial data said that uh, those who who developed severe hyperkalemia, which needed a change in the management was less than 1%. Um, but then there was a caveat, there was an issue there in the sense that the trials are usually done under very controlled settings. The trial population essentially consisted of relatively younger patients with less multiple comorbidities. Uh, you could not read too much into the uh, trial data. And as you rightly said, when, when, when we started to look at real world data, real world registries, um, those percentages was much higher, as you mentioned, uh, ranging from uh, 5 to 5.5 range of hyperkalemia was seen in close to 10 to 15 percent of patients, and more than 5.5 was seen in 5 to 8 percent of patients. So, so definitely the problem is much more common than what the trials initially told us, because in real world experience, we are dealing with patients with multiple comorbidity, as she as you mentioned, heart failure, borderline GFRs. Um, coexisting comorbidities like diabetes. So, so definitely, it's a much more uh, common clinical problem than what we inquire, what we encounter in um, in trial data for sure. Um, so, regarding the uh, the 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 uh, the recommendations regarding management, I think I think you've you've clearly pointed out that uh, the benefits, of course, are substantial. And there was a recent study uh, in the last two years, if I remember, in 2019, late. Uh, there is a paper which um, looked at uh, what happens to the patient's outcomes when MRAs are stopped. And essentially, they looked at elderly patients who develop hyperkalemia and reductions in EGFR, and they found that their cardiovascular event rates were quite higher. 
So as much as possible to try to remain with uh, MRAs uh, uh, on close monitoring because of their benefits. But as we all know, uh, under practical circumstances, when a patient consistently has potassium of more than 5.5, significant depression EGFR, um, those are, I mean, it may be more clinically prudent perhaps to, to take uh, uh, these patients off the drug, especially when regular monitoring um, is, is not uh, possible. So the next question was supposed to be a little bit of a common question, but I'd like to continue with Dr. Sunit, um, if I may. So um, how, how, how would you prefer to manage these patients once they develop severe hyperkalemia? Um, um, Dr. Sunit, would you, would yeah. you mind taking yes, this? Yes, yes, of course, sir. Uh, yes, how many patients? As I've already told, more than 5.5, definitely we will stop uh, uh, the treatment for the time being. And if it is severe hyperkalemia, definitely our previous hyperkalemia measures can be uh, taken like glucose insulin drip and uh, resins and other things may be initiated. Uh, once the severe hyperkalemia uh, had reached to the uh, like, uh, lower levels, like the, once the potassium becomes uh, within 5.5 range, we may actually go ahead, stop the active treatment of the hyperkalemia and we can actually go ahead with the potassium restricted diet alone. And uh, there are so many studies that actually talks about whether we should continue MRIs along with the potassium resins. But ultimately, all the studies ultimately uh, says that, okay, it is not worth uh, like uh, going ahead with both the treatment. So right now, we will uh, continue only with the potassium restricted diet if there is moderate hypokalemia. And if it is severe, definitely we have to discontinue the treatment. And uh, if it is controlled at some point of time, we may try to reintroduce it, like something. Yes. So yeah, fantastic. So, so, um, so essentially, I think. So, on one side, we have uh, the lot of a lot of data saying that continuing MRAs are uh, very essential in terms of you know reducing the cardiovascular mortality, all-cause mortality, and reducing the frequency of hospitalization for heart failure. And of course, on the other hand, we have the very serious clinical issue of uh, hyperkalemia. And, and like you pointed out, the recommendation is in fact to, to sort of you know continue if it can be closely monitored and if a severe hyperkalemia can be uh, overcome. The other clinical question here, and it's been sort of a debate, so it has been a debate over the last four to five years, is that considering the benefits that these drugs offer, do you would you like to consider maintaining these patients on anti-hyperkalemic measures so that they can continue uh, MRAs? So this has been a controversial question, so there have been you know, two schools of thought. Um, I, I, I can say that in our experience in our heart failure clinic um, at our institute, we have not actually pursued the aggressive strategy of maintaining the patient on uh, a potassium ion exchange resin and continuing on MRA just to prevent hyperkalemia. So, so it, it, it's, it's an aggressive step. There are some, uh, you know, centers, heart failure centers in the West who advocate such a strategy, but such an aggressive strategy has not really taken off. So what are those agents available? I think, of course, um, we have the calcium exchange resins, which are commonly used. And there are two newer agents which have come. One is called patiromer, and the other one uh, is, um, uh, is uh, um, a, a, cyclos a cyclosilicate, uh, which essentially acts, uh, both act as uh, ion resins in the GI tract. So whether, you know, maintaining these drugs in addition to MRAs will have any outcome benefit is yet to be proven. So, so I think that the very aggressive step of maintaining a patient on antihyperkalemic measures and continuing MRA simultaneously, uh, I think the jury is still out on that, and uh, it's uh, it's quite uh, debatable in that sense. Um, so we have question number one and question number six, which have not been taken, which we have skipped. Um, uh, is Dr. Paul or Dr. Sadakula available to take those questions? Yes, sir. Both are available. Please go ahead. So I'll just start with the first question. So question number one, I think, um, welcome Dr. Paul to the meeting. Uh, so the question that we uh, that we intended to uh, pose to you as a part of this panel was, uh, in what percentage of heart failure patients uh, 
um, uh, approach you uh, in the NYHA two to four classes? And uh, what do you feel regarding the general timing when we diagnose heart failure patients in India? Do you think that we diagnose them a little earlier on, or do you think that we usually catch them quite late? Uh, Dr. Paul. Yes, uh, regarding this, um, can you hear me? I'm uh, yes, late. Yes, yeah, clearly, please go ahead. Yes, uh, this uh, NYHA classification, stage one, there is no symptoms and no uh, no signs and signs of heart failure, and otherwise it is uh, pre heart failure, and uh, the high risk people they they have this um, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and uh, smoking. All these people are high risk people. They are they might get heart failure in the near future. There is a stage one or stage B, stage A. Coming to stage two, a slight limited. Uh, physical activity also they have symptoms and uh, symptoms during ordinary activity also there will be symptoms and that otherwise it is called uh, stage b in other words we thought that is pre-heart failure with uh, le le left ventricular failure on echo and uh, stage three is marked uh, uh, limitation in the activity ordinary less than normal activity also with symptoms no symptoms at rest otherwise that stage C, that is the already diagnosed case of heart failure, and the third, so the fourth one is frank um, heart failure, the with pulmonary edema, and also it is categorized as uh, three stages according to the ejection fraction. That is uh, above uh, stage uh, categorization one is above fifty percentage, and categorization two it is the forty one to forty nine percentage, and categorization three is the um, 40, 40, less than 40 percentage of ejection fraction. This uh, Regarding this, uh, uh, only 15 percent of the heart failure cases will be uh, will be under under diagnosed, may not be may not be able to uh, diagnose this uh, 15 percent of heart failure cases. Early detection of heart failure uh, probably we are missing because of no specificity of symptoms and the previous comorbidities and the echo wouldn't have been done to those patients. And also uh, regarding this uh, awareness regarding the uh, um, patients with the heart failure uh, and also little uh, less awareness among the doctors, they might uh, diagnose different conditions like COPD or some other kind of dyspnea. The classical uh, symptoms of uh, heart failure may be present only in 21 to 66 percent of cases. Accurate diagnosis in the early stages will go for uh, investigations like uh, ECG. ECG might show uh, LV, uh, LVH and also some old MI or adenias. And also we go for the BNP, uh, brain natriuretic peptide investigation may be high in all cases of uh, uh, early stages. In, itself may be high in uh, uh, heart failure cases. Also, uh, accurate diagnosis made by echocardiography. And uh, uh, regarding this uh, uh, question, like uh, uh, majority, the 50% of the cases probably I, I meet in the OP, it will be stage two. And 25% may be stage three, and 10% will be stage four. Only 15% of it we might get in stage one. That's what I, I have to say about the. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Paul. I think uh, you're absolutely right. And I think um, all of us on the panel and the audience might, uh, I, I think, will fully agree with you that most of the patients that we, we meet in our clinic with an established diagnosis of heart failure belong to NYHA class two. Of course, uh, uh, higher grades of NYHA class relate, I mean, higher class heart failure patients are, of course, uh, they are frequent uh, in our clinical practice. And again, uh, I, I think that also gives us an opportunity uh, that is, you know, when majority of our patients are in a relatively stable NYHA class two, it gives us the opportunity to start on the foundational therapy for heart failure. Because on the other hand, if you have class three and four patients who come with an acute decompensated heart failure kind of a situation, we might not have the opportunity to start and rapidly up titrate the four uh, foundational agents of heart failure. So the patients who come to us in our clinic, actually it's a unique opportunity uh, for us to, to initiate them on our guideline directed medical therapy. Now related to this, I'd just like to share. So from India, one of the 
most detailed heart failure study experiences was from the Trivandrum heart failure uh, uh, study of the primary investigators, Dr. Hari Krishnan, who's from Sri, from Sri Chitra Institute. And uh, from their analysis, it, uh, uh, so it, it showed that only around 20% uh, of patients were started on guideline-directed therapy in hospital, and another 25% of patients uh, who, who were following up, uh, you know, as, uh, as outpatients. So those numbers are, are, are really a problem. And, um, and I think it's very important for us to, you know, you know uh, address every heart failure patient on a case-by-case -case basis, especially when they present when stage two, it's an opportunity when they have relatively stable, relatively stable blood pressure. It's an opportunity to gradually up titrate them on the four foundational therapies of, um, of uh, heart failure. So quickly, we'll move on to question number six, which we did not discuss. And um, um, uh, one second. Yes. Um, so th this question, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Sadakutullah to the discussion. And I'd like to pose uh, this uh, panel discussion question to him is um, of all of the two MRAs, uh, epilirinone and spironolactone, um, are, which are the clinical circumstances when you would prefer one over the other? And uh, is it related to any specific patient profile? Dr. Sadakutullah, please. Dr. Sadakutullah is on the meeting. Will, will he be able to uh, take this question? Uh, Sajid, please, Dr. Um, yes, sir. Sure, Dr. Sadakatola is there in the meeting. Uh, I think there is a technical glitches for him for unmute. Okay. I think so, sir. Uh, would you like us to wait uh, for a few minutes? Or? No, sir. We will move on to common uh, question. One more common question is there. Then we will wait for him. Yeah, or sure. otherwise, we will find out. Yeah, sure. So, so uh, the, the the question number nine, I think uh, Dr. S uh, Dr. Sunit has addressed in a very thorough fashion. Um, so, uh, the last question of the panel uh, is: uh, In clinical practice, how early should the MRAs be initiated for the management of heart failure patients? So, so I'd like to take this opportunity to take this question myself. And so essentially, um, you know, in one of the earlier slides, I mentioned that you know we've uh, we've come a long way. Uh, in terms of the evidence of treating patients with heart failure with reduced ejection function. And we now have four foundational therapies, that is number one, beta blocker, two, ACE, ARB, or ARNI, number three, MRAs, and number four, SDLT2 inhibitors. So four foundational therapies should be initiated as early as possible is the dictum now. And as I mentioned, currently, as of 2022, the methodology that we follow is what is called as the rapid sequencing for the four foundational therapies. So the rapid sequencing methodology is step one. We prefer to start a beta blocker and a CLT2 inhibitor starting doses, then give a, cup, a week or two interval to bring in ACE, ARB, or ARNI, as the case may be. And then after another two, two weeks or two to three weeks titration, finally to bring in MRAs. So essentially the rapid sequencing methodology is to have any dose of the four foundational therapies. It need not be the target dose. Any dose of the four foundational therapies on board by around four to six weeks. So, so in this question, uh, how early are MRAs initiated for the management of heart failure patients? This should be the general rule of thumb. But as I said before, these rules are not set in stone. If you have a very stable patient in, in the clinic or in the hospital, uh, you may choose to up titrate much faster than this and perhaps introduce MRAs even earlier, maybe by week, week two or week three. So, so, or you may choose to start it simultaneously with an ARB or ARNI as the case may be. So the rapid sequence method is just a, a pathway. It's just a guideline. Clinician can have the discretion of being very flexible as, as, as long as the EGFR and the hyperkalemia and the patient's general blood pressure and hemodynamic status remain 
uh, remain stable. So, so the practical guidance regarding the timing of MRI initiation as it stands today, today's uh, guideline. Uh, is uh, Dr. Fussell available to take his uh, question? Sajid? Yes, sir. Yeah, would he be able to take this question or? The clean neuron is more specific, isn't it? Uh, yes, uh, is more specific, uh, definitely. So, um, so it offers its advantages, uh, sir, regarding uh, its, uh, uh, its less effect on uh, the progesterone, androgen, and glucocorticoid receptors. So, essentially, the the, biggest, the largest or, or the most frequent most frequent clinical side effect that we see with spinal atrophy is, of course, uh, gynecomastia and. Uh, Hyperkalemia is less than a epi 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 and also um, it can be used in uh, diabetes uh, and uh, CKD also. That is correct. Certain thing, and also in um, it, it, it may not develop any sexual dysfunction mm -hmm. rather than aldehyde, spinal atrophy. Yes, so um, so there have been no real head-to-head -head comparisons per se. So all that we have is a meta-analysis, uh, which looks at uh, you know large registry data and then comparing patients who are on epilirinone and spirulactone. And as you correctly said, the 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 uh, the hormone-related effects uh, are substantially less with epilirinone uh, and than spirulactone, and uh, gynecomastia is definitely less. Uh, there are some case series, there are some registry data which seems to show that uh, for, for an equivalent dose, hyperkalemia may be a touch lesser with epilirinone uh, in, in, in that sense. So um, definitely, I think if a patient develops gynecomastia, it makes definite sense to uh, switch over to, uh, switch over to uh, epilirinone. And uh, in terms of their relative efficacy, in terms of heart failure outcomes of cardiovascular mortality, all-cause mortality, or hospitalization, uh, they perform relatively well and relatively uh, equally in terms of efficacy, in terms of their relative production. So for spironolactone, we have the RALS and the emphasis trials, and epilirinone, we have the emphasis trials. Uh, uh, which have clearly shown uh, that uh, the benefits are quite uh, similar uh, under those circumstances. And of course, in practical terms, epilirinone is a little bit more expensive uh, than spironolactone. So I think that will also be a good, a big factor um, when we are, you know, uh, uh, prescribing uh, the, this agent. You know, we are definitely we are planning to give it for a very, very long time. So cost will definitely be. Um, uh, a factor. So uh, that brings us to the uh, conclusion of the uh, uh, of the panel discussion uh, today, where you know we have discussed in summary regarding the uh, current status of the uh, in terms of the we know that there are four foundational therapies which are available for the management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And just a word of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The we had a landmark trial called the TopCat trial, which looked at MRAs in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Unfortunately, we did not have very positive data uh, for MRAs in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So I'd like to re-emphasize that the benefits of MRAs are most robust in heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction. So of the four foundational therapies, MRA is definitely has a major role in, in, in amongst those four, age, amongst uh, the other three agents. Uh, for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Um, we went through uh, what are the potential benefits of heart of MRAs in this population. We also saw uh, uh, how we must um, uh, sort of evaluate a patient before we start the patient on MRAs, how we must monitor and how we must up titrate uh, these drugs, uh, either epilirinone or spironolactone. And we also saw some of the relative benefits of epilirinone over spironolactone. And uh, we also saw uh, the major adverse events are uh, either reduction in GFR or, of course, the much more clinical problem, hyperkalemia. And we know that they are more common than what the trials suggest in our real-world practice. And we also saw 
uh, some practical pointers how to manage patients once they develop hyperkalemia um, uh, when patients are uh, initiated on either spironolactone or uh, ep epilurinone. Um, but I think considering uh, the, the profile, uh, the beneficial profile of this drug, we must attempt as much as possible to maintain MRA in the prescription of patient bacteria. So just before we end, I'd like to uh, invite uh, any one of the panel members who have any uh, clarification or question that they would like to discuss or any additional point that they would like to make. And, uh, and, and after that, probably Sajid, um, we can uh, wind up the panel discussion tonight. The MRS can be uh, combined with uh, ARNI also. That's, that's correct. Uh, so, um, so essentially, um, when you look at the ARNI trial data, which is a paradigm HF uh, trial data, uh, there were a significant proportion of patients who were also coexistently on MRAs. So the answer is absolutely yes. But the same precautions that we, uh, um, we look at when a patient is on simultaneous ACE or ARB holds good for a patient who is simultaneously on uh, ARNI and MRA. Yes. To prevent hyper hyperkalemia, we can uh, add uh, fusimide along with this MRA. Uh, yes, yes. So, so that's one of the, uh, that's one of the practical, uh, the practical, you know, sort of uh, uh, practical tricks. I think one can probably, you know, uh, you know, uh, in readjusting the prescription. You're absolutely right. I think there are situations where um, we may find that uh, loop diuretics may offset. Uh, the uh, the tendency of MRAs to retain potassium. So, so when we do that, we always play a balance between you know over diuresing the patient and causing a reduction in GFR because of that particular action. But I think that is uh, you're absolutely right. A loop diuretic will definitely offset the retention the potassium retaining tendency of MRAs. All that we generally need to do is sort of uh, look at the volume status of the patient and if there is any fall in GFR as we move forward uh, in these patients. So once we consciously, you know, uh, uptitrate uh, furosemide for this purpose. But you're right, it can offset the uh, uh, potassium retaining uh, tendency. If the patient is stable, we can make it alternate days, MRAs? MRAs. So, yeah, so... It's it's not a question which has a lot of it's it's not a strategy which has a lot of data. So has it been done? Have we clinically done it before? The answer is yes. Uh, but if, but if you if you if you ask me regarding the supportive data, it's not really there. Uh, so in terms of the clinical practice uh, to sort of reduce the frequency of hyperkalemia, possibly yes, it may be a little effective. Uh, but I have to be honest to say that uh, the data doesn't support. Um, uh, such a strategy. Hmm. What are the other drugs like hydrolysine? Oh, hydrolysine, yes. So when we usually face with the patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and we, when we see that the EGFR is low, uh, and um, so in such instance, in such a patient, we know that right up front, this is a patient who is at high risk to develop you know, a further deterioration in EGFR if they're exposed to ACE, ARB, ARNI, or develop hyperkalemia with um, MRA. Um, so it, the first step in this patient is to sort of um, uh, add on hydrolyzine with nitrate combination, which is isolazine. Uh, so, we have, uh, so we have a vasodilator in the form of uh, hydrolyzine, which, which actually substitutes the ACE, ARB, or ARNI in such a patient subgroup. It's interesting actually to see how this combination came about in patients with heart failure. Essentially, it was developed for patients of African, Afro-American ancestry. Uh, because in, in, in their DNA, uh, uh, you know, there are DNA variations called SNP. So Afro-American Afro patients with heart failure, they don't respond well to ACE inhibitors or ARBs because the DNA variants are configured in such a way. They don't respond, genetically speaking. So that's when this particular combination was actually designed for Afro-American ancestry patients with heart failure, and it was found to have you know, a favorable cardiovascular effect profile. So we are sort of extrapolating that data uh, to, to patients of other ancestry um, who actually have relative contraindications for ACRB, such as a low GFR. So, so I think to answer your question, use isolazine in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. 
And the contraindication to ACE, ARB, or ARNI, let's say creatinine is 2, 2.53, or the EGFR is much less than 30. Uh, there are situations where we would use that drug. Yeah. I want to add is whenever you see, see a patient with a resistant hypertension, that is, we are using more than three or four drugs for controlling hypertension. If it, if it is not getting controlled, that spironolactone is a very good drug to reduce the pressure. Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, it's uh, it's um, I'm, I'm I'm it's fantastic that you brought out that point. Um, so in the in in today's uh, hypertension guidelines, um, whether it be the European or the uh, American guidelines, um, spironolactone or epilirinone has got a real place in the management of uh, resistant hypertension. So it has made difference in uh, some of the very difficult to treat hypertension subsets. Absolutely right. One more point. When we give uh, AC inhibitor in a case of uh, congestive cardiac failure, we have to titrate to the most upper dose to get the most uh, effect, like uh, to reduce the mortality rate and all. So you should use the highest dose possible in, in AC inhibitor. Is there any highest dose for spironolactone or um, the the if you look at the uh, doses which have been studied, in, uh, which have been associated with the mortality benefit, they have always ranged between 25 to 50 once a day for spironolactone and epilirinone. Um, of course, the guidelines recommend an initiation dose of 25, and sometimes some subsets of patients do remain only on 25 due to some of the problems that we have just mentioned earlier. Uh, so 25 to 50. Is, it seems to be the dose range in which most of the trials in emphasis, Ephesus, and uh, RAS, which have been associated with, um, with um, um, uh, uh, reductions in, in or, or which have caused a favorable cardiovascular profile. So ideal circumstances, definitely 50 milligrams once a day um, would be the recommended dose. But uh, due to some practical limitations, we may be left with 25 milligrams um, in certain patients. There is also this very interesting observation that when patients take MRAs along with SGLT2 inhibitors, there is some data which seems to show that the incidence of hyperkalemia is less. Now, We've had a lot of critical analysis of this phenomenon, and the the current uh, the observation is definitely real, but the the current uh, explanation is that it may be a chance finding. So the jury is still out on this observation, but there is some trend which seems to suggest that it is lesser. So it may just be a chance finding in some of the uh, some of the trials which looked at SGLT2 inhibitor use. So we're just waiting for you know more data. Uh, to have a more conclusive aspect on that. So if there are no more questions, uh, Sajid, um, do you think uh, that it's time yeah. to... Yeah. yeah, I would like to uh, thank you all for your uh, wonderful discussion on the meeting. Thank you, Hisham, sir, for your moderating well on the section. Thank you, all the panelists, for the, your discussion. Make the program grant and appreciate your time spending for the scientific forum. We will keep on tracking and keep on conducting such kind of meetings furthermore. And once again, thank you all for the conducting meeting. Thank you for your valuable time spending with us. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Isham.